One refreshing thing about being 41 years old is that more and more of the people I speak to are a little bit more mature themselves. And even if they're not, they feel some kind of pressure. <laughs> they, feel, they feel they have to live up to the expectation of being that little bit more mature when they talk to me. So when I was younger, if I read any philosopher whatsoever, people would throw it in my face like with the assumption that I'm some kind of die-hard, uncritical fan of this philosopher, and I agree with everything they say. So I, I would be reading the philosophy of Arthur Schopenhauer. People would be like, yeah, well, Schopenhauer says it'd be better if we weren't even born at all, if we just didn't live. What do you think about that with your fucking show? Why do you even read that book, man? Like, this is, this is Canada we're talking. These are, these are white, English-speaking Canadians, members of the, of the culture that I have dubbed the who do you think you are, don't you know who I think I am mentality. That's the mentality. Who do you think you are, don't you know who I think I am. This even extended to when I was reading the Quran, the Quran being the religious text that the Muslim faith is based on, the Islamic faith. Like... The fact that I'm reading this book doesn't mean I agree with it, guys. I mean, whatever the philosopher is, I, I totally hate Immanuel Kant. But if you don't actually read Immanuel Kant, you can't criticize them. I mean, and you know, who can really know anything about the European tradition of philosophy without reading names like uh, Socrates and Plato and Aristotle? I am not an uncritical fan of any of these authors. But I start by giving credit to you guys in my audience and those of you who take the time to talk to me on Patreon or by email or what have you. Um, in the last couple of years, people have really not treated me that way. I can't remember a single person writing to me with the assumption that like I'm an uncritical fan of Socrates, let alone Plato. Not one. I've never had that backhanded approach now. And I think it probably is because I'm 41 years old. That's probably. Obviously, back when I was a scholar of Buddhism, there were a lot of misconceptions and misperceptions. Well, what do you really represent? What do you really, what is it you sympathize with within this philosophy? Okay. But this video, we're talking about a really important example of an issue where I utterly, utterly disagree with Socrates and I even sort of despise him. And it's an issue that I think cuts down to the most fundamental question of what democracy is and what democracy should be. And that has to do with our belief in education, human equality, and human inequality. So I'm just going to discuss one text briefly, and I'm just going to chit-chat with my girlfriend about this, to be perfectly frank with you. Um, there is a text I think people don't pay enough attention to these days called First Alcibiades. The name Alcibiades is pronounced six different ways in modern English. You may know him as Alcibiades or something like this. All right, first Alcibiades. Um, at one point, Socrates says to Alcibiades, trying to motivate him to be a better politician, to be a better leader in a democracy, Athens is a democracy, says to him, you must be aware of who your true competition is. Your true competition aren't just the other democratic leaders here in Athens who want to be important influential people. Your real competition is the king of Persia. This dictator, the area that's now Iran, Greece and Persia have been at war on and off for the whole lifetime of Socrates and long thereafter, long before and long thereafter, I suppose. And Alcibiades actually gives a quite intelligent answer on that point. And he says basically, look, I understand what you're saying here. But to be perfectly honest with you, I think of the, the king of Persia, I think of the emperor of Persia as a normal person, just like you and I think of him as a normal human being. Right. And Socrates says back, this really tells you something about the elitism in the whole philosophy of Socrates and the whole philosophy of Plato. Socrates says back to him, no, no, you mustn't say that, you mustn't think that. Think of the education that the emperor of Persia has had. And he then lists off all these fantastic claims about how since the day he was born, the king of Persia has learned horse riding from the greatest warrior in all of the Persian empire, how the greatest mathematician has taught him math, how there's this series of like, you know, genius level intellects who've been recruited from across the vast empire of millions of people of, of, of Persia to teach and 
tutor this young person to be the best king possible, to be the best intellectual possible, and best leader possible. And then he turns to Alcibiades and he says, you, you were supposed to be raised by Pericles. Pericles was not his biological father, but the great political Pericles had a kind of special role in his education upbringing. Often uh, he was like his godfather or godparents, not worth digressing deals. So you, you know who was supposed to be responsible for your education? was Pericles. And all Pericles did was give you an old secondhand slave. A slave who was too old to work in the fields, a slave who was too old to be worth any money, was handed over to be your tutor. And look how you turned out. And already in this conversation they've established that actually Alcibiades agrees with Socrates. And same with Alcibiades feels that he's had a poor education, that he hasn't learned what he needs to know to move ahead now and be a great leader in this democracy. Okay, so already <laughs> you have to feel the profound elitism here. And it's not an elitism based on money. It's not just based on the assumption that the rich are superior to the poor. It's not an elitism based on ethnic difference. I mean, quite the contrary. Uh, here is a Greek who's willing to regard a Persian as in no way inferior to him on the basis of race. It's not based on ancestry or breeding. It's based on education in a sense, in the same way we still understand education today, but this is Socrates living in a society where there was no formal system of education whatsoever unless you count military training. They did have a formal system of, of military training, and it was from the military tradition that Socrates and, and Aristotle also got the inspiration that their whole society could be improved if they had standardized education for everyone, or at least standardized education for everyone who would appreciate it, perhaps. All right. Now, there's just one brief quote I typed out here I want to read verbatim. Okay. Where Socrates says to Alcibiades, joking, Oh no, my friend, I am quite wrong, and I think that you ought rather to turn your attention to Midias the quail breeder and others like him who manage our politics, in whom, as the women would remark, you may still see the slaves' cut of hair cropping out in their minds as well as on their pates, and they come with their barbarous lingo to flatter us and not to rule us. So this is Socrates insulting Midias the quail breeder. So this is Midias, obviously a farmer, a farmer who breeds quails. Socrates just thinks it's grotesque and laughable, that it's a joking matter, that a farmer, that a quail breeder would have a leading role in Athenian politics. How dare he? And he still has the same haircut as a slave. He still has the same mentality as a slave. It's obviously an intentional and untranslatable play on words. The point is that in the past, he had the same haircut as a slave, and it still shows in his way of, of thinking. All right, Socrates is an elitist. He does think that a quail breeder, that a farmer like this, should have no place in politics. And I would just note the politics by Aristotle. So the title of the book is just Politics by Aristotle. <laughs> Many elements of that book are using paradox and humor and irony. It's very hard to tell when Aristotle is really being sincere with us and when he's being a bit provocative and joking around or when he's kind of setting up a sort of suggestive confusion for his reader so that then later on he can tell you what he really thinks. You know, Even professors today do that. They say, well, this is a very complicated issue. There are many sides to the story, blah, 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 blah. And then later on they say, and, and here's, here's the solution. Here's why you should trust my perspective. And he does a lot of this kind of thing, a lot of baffled gab, to be perfectly honest. But one thing he says again and again is he just feels there's no place for common tradesmen in politics and the democracy. It comes up in different in different contexts. <laughs> Socrates himself was a common tradesman. He was a stone cutter. He was a stone merchant. Some people like to claim that he was a sculptor. If you even study the text, there isn't really evidence for that. He might have been involved in the sculpting business a little bit, but it seems that for the most part, he measured and cut and sold stone. That he wasn't he wasn't an artist per se, but he was in the stone, the stone cutting business, the stone retailing business. What am I going to tell you? He was a lowly tradesman, right? And, and Aristotle was a medic. Medic means you're like a third class citizen in, in Athens. You can't 
anyway, he's completely barred. These are people who themselves are not in any way members of the Athenian elite. Now, admittedly, Aristotle, back in his hometown, he was a little bit of an elite figure. His father was a medical doctor uh, who got along with the ruling family way up north. Um, but anyway, that's, that's kind of another story. In Athens, he had quite a lowly status, actually, Aristotle did. Okay? And yet we have this totally unblushing, unrepentant uh, elitism. That, you know, okay, I don't just find it despicable. I don't just find it immoral. I don't just... I actually think it's, it's incorrect. I think it's wrong in a totally pragmatic sense. What do you mean Midias the quail breeder is a bad political leader? Still to this day, if you're a quail breeder, if you're a quail farmer who promises the right set of policies and you're motivated to do it, you say, hey, if you elect me, I'm going to get rid of corruption in politics. I'm going to reform the way voting works. Here's the list of what I'm going to do. So elect me and I'm going to get it done. Damn straight. Great. Then the quail breeder is the right man for the job, right? So Melissa, Melissa here, my girlfriend on camera, you've also read uh, Thucydides, Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War. Some of the politicians, they were lowly, right? They were lowly figures. Isn't it Cleon, who's this kind of despised military leader who's, you know, come up from the lower classes? He's not uh, he's not as erudite and aristocratic as some others, but he's a yeah. somewhat brutal, you know, military leader in the world. Who's to say that his opinion doesn't count? Why shouldn't he be a, a political leader too, Yeah. The sense that I got is that how you spoke was more important than yes. what your position was prior to being in politics. So I, it is interesting to hear this. I haven't read this work, but, you know, to hear Socrates saying this. Right. Oh, okay. It, they were quite right. harsh to people who couldn't yes. be eloquent and express themselves in a, you know. And, and, and very slight differences of accent were, were dis despised. So, you know, the difference between an Athenian accent and a Boeotian accent. This is the British pronunciation of Boeotia, but th like the next suburb north from Athens. Very, let alone the difference between an Athenian accent and a Spartan accent or something. Completely despised for this. Yeah, this is true. Yeah, what I got from Thucydides was mostly the speeches of these different leaders and how they impacted the citizens who were following them. Or, okay, or the, okay. yeah. you, you believe that? Because, I mean, even this one quotation, that Midias the quail breeder, you know, he used to have the haircut of a slave and now he still has the mentality of a slave. You, you really think a well-spoken poor person, a well-spoken quail breeder or, or, or tradesperson or what have you, or even Socrates himself, you really think... Like th this attitude to me, um, it's, I mean, it's not as bad as racism. It's not that it's just born into you. But the idea is if you don't have the correct education, then you can't, you, you can't or you shouldn't participate in politics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I wish I had something to say that would disagree with what <laughs> you were saying. But I mean, I, I think I tend to agree with you. And it's a yeah. problem in American politics that... Most well, of the politicians right. are elite and, you know, have this high, usually they are wealthy from wealthy families and have been able to receive education that people in lower class haven't. But, but part of this, so Melissa is from the same culture as I am. She's from Detroit. I'm from Toronto. Worlds away. Worlds away. <laughs> Other side of the river or whatever. But look, um, you know, I don't believe in our culture that the elite education is a good education. I don't think it makes you a better person. Yeah, now, that's right. now, I meet people from other cultures, particularly people from India and Pakistan, who still do really believe that education makes you a better person. Not 100%, but commonly in that culture, right? But look, if you ask me, let's look at the education Donald Trump had, right? Let's look at the education Barack Obama had. I don't think it helped him at all. Now, you know, law school is an incredibly boring, dehumanizing process. I just don't believe it. I don't believe law school makes you a better political leader. Like, I completely am willing to believe that there could be a highly motivated quail breeder, there could be a quail farmer, yeah. a lowly person who gets into politics and says, hey, look, I'm not corrupt. This is what I want to accomplish. I mean, and most, most of politics is about things that don't require, like, depth of scientific knowledge or something, right? It requires personal integrity, commitment. Uh, that you reach out to the public and communicate your message. They believe in you. And then you say, okay, elect me, and now I'm going to get this done. Yeah. I Like, <laughs> I would, there's an underlying assumption here that I would have to have faith in what that education really is, what it means, and how it transforms your character, 
or something and and within my own society you know i i don't i think president carter was the last (laughs) political leader that (laughs) was a farmer he was a peanut farmer. oh yes right 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 Right. okay so that's true so jimmy carter the president of the united states was a peanut farmer but i don't know what education he had me neither (laughs) do you think do you think jimmy carter so i'm going to look up your jimmy carter alma mater Jimmy Carter University. Now I'm going to get a university named after Jimmy Carter or something, right? There we go. Where did Jimmy Carter go to college? Yep, so he did. He went to Georgia Tech. Georgia Southwestern and uh, Georgia Tech. So I, I, I do not know. Oh, here we go. Bachelor of Science. And then he joined the Navy where he served in the submarine corps. All right. <laughs> interesting subject especially given the fact that you recorded a video recently about if you are to be involved in vegan politics that yes. you want to be a vo- <laughs> you know want it to be elitist right, right, so it is right. funny to hear this right right after that um yeah i mean who do you want to be in power she just criticized me in a really subtle way if you didn't catch a guy <laughs> <laughs> no no yeah. it's i just think it's actually you know something that goes without saying in american politics that right. the people who get into power are, are from uh, wealthy families that are able they're able to afford this education that you say you know right. question the value of does this really make you a better leader just because you've been able to jump well, through the hoops that's what i think and even the information you learn is it really relevant yeah I mean, you learn something going through law school or going to business school like donald trump you learn i'm not saying you learn nothing yeah. I just don't think it's it's relevant to the soul of democracy in that way. Yeah, I've sorry, I'm trying not to get too off topic, but I have kind of reflected recently on my education growing up and that I think uh, you really can succeed in American education system if you're able to jump through all the hoops, if you're able to study all the study guides and do all of the test prep. You know, you can do a test prep course and get a high score on the SAT. Or and something. learn nothing. I think that's where this is going and remain completely vacuous and ignorant. Exactly. Just, you know, you can succeed in classes and, and, and get the high grade point average that, you, that you're that um, you aiming toward, but you might not learn much. And certainly with political leaders, I, I don't know uh, if you can say that. And, and so much of politics is, is based on money in America, how much money you can raise, who you know, the connections yeah. that you have. Um, not necessarily about the education you receive. So, yeah, I mean, it's just a really interesting subject. So the next step of this discussion, it's been mentioned very briefly in a different YouTube video before. So what is the actual philosophy of education that Socrates has? This remains fairly unknown. It's, it is actually written out clearly enough in the dialogues. And, and note, I am choosing here to attribute this to Socrates, not to Plato. I do think this is Socrates' own approach. The next step he takes, even within this one doc dialogue, uh, First Alcibiades, and it's the same in the Gorgias, and so on and so forth, as he says, well, but you know what education is really about is not the knowledge of facts, it's not just the ability to do math, it's not any particular craft like guiding a boat or painting a picture, or you know, no, there's this ultimate knowledge he believes in, which is knowledge of self, which is self-knowledge, which he presents in this very frankly religious you know way he he relates this to the oracle at delphi and greek religion and he attributes these various kind of mystical and transformative powers to true knowledge of self knowing your limits knowing your own ignorance and that that is ultimately the point of all his discussion about what's the true meaning of piety what's the true meaning of justice it's not just to force people to admit that they don't know what justice is it's to get them to recognize this this idea of, of knowledge of self now this also explains the completely reckless megalomania, or egomania, I should say, of Socrates, okay? So it's clear in First Alcibiades, and I think it's even more extreme in Gorgias, which is a, a different dialogue written by Plato. Socrates considers himself the greatest political leader in Athens, that he is the true master of what democracy and politics and leading society is all about. I think you'd find that a little bit more implicitly, a little bit more toned down even in Plato's Republic and in many other sources. There's this sense that he is really the greatest man in Athens in this bizarre sense. And in both dialogues, both 
first Rubiades and Gorgias, he openly reviles and insults Pericles as being inferior to him as a leader in this way, right? Now, of course, they're two very different contexts, but this is completely surreal to me. This is really laughable. So again, this is an example of where I really disagree with and I, I really scorn Socrates in as much as we know him. I think this would be just as ridiculous as if I claimed to be a, a greater political leader than uh, Richard Nixon or, uh, um, <laughs> sorry, the British leader during World War II, uh, um, Winston Churchill, right? So Winston Churchill is a good example. Where you have this massive towering figure who made tremendous decisions with tremendous long-term implications. Pericles was this leader during a time of war, and he transformed the whole fate of the city. Now look, let's keep it all the way real. Do I think I am ethically a better person than Richard Nixon? Yes, I do. I actually do. I actually do. You know, I've studied what Nixon did. Do I think I'm ethically a better person than Winston Churchill? As a matter of fact, I do. And actually, in both cases, one very simple factor is alcoholism. Actually, both of those men, alcohol was a much bigger part of their story than anyone now wants to admit it was. Um, it, yeah, this is both a symptom of what was wrong with these guys ethically, and it's also part of the problem in their judgment decision-making. So I could very easily say I might have made better decisions. But what we're questioning here is not hypothetically if you were the emperor, whether or not you would make better decisions than the emperor. This is Socrates who is a humble stonemason, a humble craftsman and stone carver with really no political power and no political authority, who never made any decisions that affected anyone, right? Claiming, present tense, that he is, right then and there, that he is really the better or the best political leader in Athens, that he's the one to teach. He's the one to teach Alcibiades how to be a great political leader, and that he's the true master of the science and philosophy of politics, Whereas someone like Pericles to him is just a joke, is just contemptible, is just awful. And someone like Midias the quail breeder is just all. So there is a really deep egomania. He really thinks he's superior to these other people. And I, I know, so I, 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 the question of what year precisely Plato wrote each of these dialogues is unknown to me. I think it is a Rube's game. I think, it, I think we can never really know exactly when they're written and in what order. There, there are some questions we can't answer about these texts, all right? Um, the political, re pardon me, the political career of Alcibiades is a total disaster. <laughs> it, it very much leads to Socrates himself being put on trial and executed. And in his defense, even in Plato's version, he very briefly says, well, you can't blame me for what Alcibiades did wrong. Oh, yes, they can, Socrates. <laughs> you were this guy's tutor and his benefactor. You were very obviously the puppet master pulling the strings. You were much more than just his teacher. And indeed, even this one dialogue, First Alcibiades, immortalizes that, this philosophical relationship between Socrates and a young, ambitious, military and political leader. He was both. He was both a military leader and a political leader. And by the way, he had just come back from the Olympic Games where he made himself famous. You know, he became a kind of rock star. He became a, a name everyone knew and was talking about. He was already somewhat infamous in his youth, but Alcibiades came back from the Olympic Games ready to go into politics as someone, you know, famous in, in this way. He was also considered staggeringly beautiful in a culture that was obsessively homosexual and pederastic. So in this context also, his beauty and his voice and his athletics and, and these things set him up for a career. And Socrates was the uh, the eminence grise. He was the gray-bearded old man standing behind that powerful figure. And Alcibiades' political career was a total, total disaster. It was a disaster for him. It was a disaster for Athens. It was a disaster for Sparta because he switched sides several times. He was betrayed his own side in the war. It, it is really a mystifying I, and we have a lot of detailed evidence about what happened throughout his whole career, right up, right up to his death. We're all left astounded at how terrible, you know, this pupil of Socrates was. And look, let's just briefly include Plato in the equation. So Plato is the one writing these dialogues that are partly historical and partly fictional and reflect Plato's bias and Plato's intention. What what happened with Plato's career, right? Also, I'll just say, long story short, it was it was a failure. 
he obviously tried to court power and uh, influence and, and get clients, uh, basically the dictators or tyrants or kings of various smaller states within the Greek realm, not within, uh, not within Athens. And politically, his ambitions all came to nothing. And also, what are considered his mature writings, the writings he wrote when he got older and older, were laughable and terrible and awful. So uh, really, Plato's book, The Laws, is what's being talked about here. It's unreadably terrible. And Aristotle laughs at it openly. And the historical evidence is everyone laughed at it openly. It wasn't uh, successful. It didn't create the new paradigm to replace Socrates, let alone to replace uh, great legislators like uh, Solon and uh, Draco and so on. So, you know, so Plato's political career in a very different way is a failure also. Obviously, his approach was, shall we say, less muscular than the political approach of, uh, of Algebiades itself. Okay, so I think this video is long enough, so I think I'll end it there. I think all of us need to reflect on the extent to which our evaluation of human nature and democracy itself implicitly is based on ideas of inequality linked to education. The idea that, you know, only a certain type of person can evaluate the budget for um, medical research and decide if the government should spend more or less. Only a certain kind of person can sit down and think how much money should go into solar power and gas power, make those hard decisions. And the military and the healthcare system, so on and so forth. But we live in a period of time when everyone knows Donald Trump has none of those qualifications. <laughs> I mean, so uh, look, another, another, sorry, this is, it's a digression, but it's actually a really meaningful one. Socrates, as written by Plato, completely laughs at with scorn another philosopher named Hippias. He's ridiculed in multiple dialogues. Okay? Hippias's philosophy, the philosophy of Hippias, is that a man, a gentleman, ought to cultivate himself to be a master in many different fields. I guess, ideally, in all fields, right? So he says he's not just a philosopher, he's also learned to wrestle, and he formally competed in wrestling at the Olympic Games. Each garment he wears, he made himself, so he learned to weave and sew. He didn't just make the cloth, he made the belt and he did the stitching. And he writes his own poetry. He has this list. I think he can play six musical instruments or something. He's mastered each of the arts that define the society. He knows each of the arts and each of the sciences at a high That's the philosophy of Hippias. And, the, and this is ridiculed by Socrates. We don't know if that's the philosophy of Socrates or the philosophy of Plato or both. Honestly, I would guess both. I would guess it's the philosophy of Socrates as imperfectly reported by Plato. Because that is consistent with the idea of education that Socrates has. His idea is that fundamentally and profoundly, education is not about any manual skill, about any particular kind of technical knowledge. It's about this groovy, transcendental idea he has about self-knowledge, linked to the Delphic or Oracle, blah, blah, blah. He has his own kind of slightly transcendental, slightly magical view of what the ultimate purpose of education is. He also only values his own philosophical style of dialogue. So like, oh, well, Hippias, you think you're so great because you've mastered all these arts and sciences and crafts and you're a wrestling champion. You're physically strong. You're physically fit. You're mentally fit. You know this. Yeah, but... If I have a dialogue with you about what is the true meaning of the word justice, you can't win that debate. So, I mean, again, in this context, I kind of despise Socrates. He comes off as really shallow and self-serving and insincere. But here's my point in this context. Hippias, the philosophy of Hippias, that one ought to be a master kind of under many, under many headings, isn't that more what we're expecting of our political leaders? in this day and age. Aren't we expecting someone like Donald Trump or Barack Obama to really appreciate the plight of the poor, to really appreciate how the healthcare system works, to really appreciate what needs to be done to improve the railroad system and the electricity system? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and aren't we perhaps asking for something impossible? But even so, that kind of background, that kind of compendious knowledge of society you do not get out of a degree in business. You do not get out of a degree in law. Um, you don't get out of any of the, the educational credentials that currently we look to our political leaders to have. Mm -hmm.